Okay, let's talk about our first topic, which is um, pretty focused just about downloading links. Now, if you were to ask a developer to write some code to download the contents of a URL, you might get something like what I've got up on the screen here. Just two lines of code, super easy, done, home early for beers. But not so fast, it's not quite that easy. It turns out to be a lot more difficult than you'd expect, which is a common theme when dealing with a large variety of infrastructures and software providers, very common. Um, I must admit, I wasn't expecting this to be difficult, but it was, so I thought I'd just talk about some of the issues I found. The first one, just simple redirects. Um, websites move around all the time, and you often find redirects to send users to the correct page. Uh, totally standard and usually invisible to you. However, if you're writing code to download, you're going to have to handle a bunch of special cases and also be security aware. You're also going to have to deal with servers returning errors and timeouts. Um, and in this case, when you're doing a large harvesting, we're downloading, um, making a lot, a lot, a lot of requests. And sometimes we're saturating the server that we're connecting to. So oftentimes these are our own fault. Um, you're going to have to implement some back off code and um, retry and decide on how long you're going to be waiting for a timeout. Um, in our processing, we found that I think we spent a cumulative time of a couple of days just waiting for timeouts, um, but they're done in parallel, so it, the actual clock time wasn't that, wasn't that bad. Um, we also had to deal with some troublesome HTTPS certificates, ones that were a bit dodgy, but we wanted to accept anyways, um, and Java and your browser can really have a disagreement about what's a valid and properly signed certificate, so you're gonna have to write a bunch of custom code to validate that. You're also gonna find some weird security procedures that people have put in place. Um, the one that sticks out for me um, is you would go, I found I was going to a server and it was infinitely redirecting back to itself. And I thought this was just some sort of misconfiguration, but I put it in a browser and it worked. And what was actually happening is you would make your first request, it would send back a redirect and it would also attach a session cookie to the redirect. And then when you made the second request, you would attach a session cookie and it would work. So that wasn't very fun, but um, I don't want to spend too much time on security. I'm sure other people have talked a lot in the conference and in other areas about that, but you have to be careful when you're downloading a large number of URLs from random URLs from the internet. And it's a fairly big attack surface and especially when you're dealing with XML documents and how you're parsing them. And you also want to protect your internal networks. Uh, just want to quickly talk about um, um, headers. Um, often you go to a URL expecting to get an XML document, but sometimes you get back an HTML page, a blank response, or an error, and you have to send a properly formatted HTTPS or HTTP um, accept header. But there's a lot of disagreement between browsers about or servers about what that is. Sometimes if you put a Q value in, it'll get confused and not respond, or if you don't put a Q value in, it'll get confused and won't respond. Um, this is the one that I found worked fine it, it, through a lot of um, trial and error, so I suggest you replicate that, and my notes will be online. And again, for efficiency, some, some of these links will be to 10 gigabyte um, data files or 1,000 page PDF, <clears throat> and you really don't want to be downloading them. It's super slow and expensive. So one thing you do is just download the first little bit of your file, um, check to see if it's an XML file, if that's what you're expecting, and then make sure that the start tag is one of the tags that you're expecting. And that can really make things much more efficient. You can really crank up your speed to 11. Uh, just a few more things on efficiency, since we're probably going to be following a million links. Um, one is to use thread pools. So you're doing a bunch of simultaneous requests. Um, as I mentioned before, you just have to be cautious that you're not overloading those machines because they'll start timing out and giving you errors. Also some HTTP request caching. Don't keep downloading the same URL since they're often replicated. And finally, for something like storage, you can store your documents based on their SHA-2 hash or some other hash. 
that saves a lot of space, especially when you're doing multiple runs. You have all these big documents and they're often not changing. So if you reference them by SHA-2 or by a hash, you're only storing them once. That can save a huge amount of space. And I can go on for hours about all the efficiencies and stuff like that, but I'm just going to mention a few. Okay, so we've been talking about really nitty-gritty technical issues um, about efficiency and things like that. Um, some hints and tricks, but the next problem is sort of a real keystone issue. Um, and it was kind of unexpected, but our links don't actually link. And those links are wrong or incomplete. You can't just go willy-nilly copying and pasting a URL out of a service document and into your browser expecting it to work. Um, I'll just give a couple examples here. This is a good one. I hope you can see that. My slides are a little bit um, not translated into PowerPoint perfectly, but um, so this is a complete link. Um, you can copy and paste this into a browser and it'll work just fine. You'll get a service record from this and, um, or you'll get a capabilities document from this and it's no problems. And you can see there's three parameters in this request. Um, the request type, get capabilities, the service, a WMS, and the version of the service that you want. So this works fine. Um, unlike in your previous example, a fully qualified URL, often you get a URL that just points to the um, endpoint of your OGC service cluster. And you can see the example highlighted in the middle of the screen. You have to then morph that URL into a get capabilities request, as I've shown at the bottom. So you have to add a request equals get capabilities, the service equals WFS, and also you might want to add a version to it. But so far, so good. So, pop quiz here. For that one in the middle, um, that's a typical service link. And there are four requests at the bottom. And these are for a WMS, a WFS, a WMTS, and an Atom feed. You can see they're different for all of them. So how do you know which of those four requests do you make? <laughs> Someone... <laughs> Yeah. The, yeah, the answer is basically you don't really know. Um, but you can look around the document for some context. And the simple thing for context is that all the service records will be either of type view or download. And if it's a view service, it will be for maps, for WMS or WMTS. And if it's a download service, it'll be for actual data, so Atom feed or a WFS. And again, you can look around in the document. Um, here's an example, and every record kind of does this differently. They're all snowflakes, so in here you can see it says in the protocol section that it's a OGC WMS, so this is almost certainly a WMS. And if you look at the actual URL, you'll see there's WMS in the URL, so this is a WMS request so you would know what kind, type of service you're talking to. And you might think you need some type of AI or machine learning to do this, but I found that there's just a few simple heuristics and getting a little bit of context and looking at a bunch of examples, you can get the right answer almost all the time. So let's just summarize where we are right now. Um, this is for downloading. First, you find the links in the service documents. That's over there on the far left. As I just talked about, we need to use context um, in the record and some heuristics to transform that URL into something usable. That's the big brain. And then we need to actually go to the internet and efficiently download the capabilities document. That's the hear no, see no, speak no evil monkeys because of all the special cases you're going to have to handle. And you end up with, an, on the far right, uh, OGC or an Atom capabilities file, and it's all good. Okay, finish the first section. Uh, we're moving on to the, the last one, which is talking about linkage between documents. And again, Jordi and Yaron yesterday talked uh, quite a bit more in depth than this, so I'm not gonna fill that in again. Um, and I can talk hours explaining about how linking works and all the special cases you have to handle, but 
I'm just going to simplify and, and move a bit quickly, but I did want to make sure there was a reference here because there's, it's not obvious by reading the specifications how to do this. Okay, Whew, back to our scary diagram. Um, we just talked about that top line there, the service document through the service document links to the capabilities document. And what I want to talk about is the highlighted section on the right, which is connections from the metadata to the data and vice versa. Um, sorry, the connections between the capabilities document and the data and the metadata. Um, so I just want to flip this diagram at the capabilities on its side so we can see um, a little more detail in what goes on in a capabilities document for Inspire. So there's our capabilities document. Again, I just flipped this on its side. And there's two major components to an Inspire capabilities document. First is an extended um, Inspire extended metadata. That's um, green at the top. Uh, which, is the header doc which is the header to the document which talks about information in the entire document. And it may or may not be present. Um, there's also a set of layers at the bottom, and I put layers in quotes because they're called feature types in a WFS and um, items in an Atom feed. Uh, but it contains information specific to a layer. And another note is that data sets can be comprised of multiple layers. So just drilling into that section, um, You'll find two, two parts in the Inspire Extended Metadata. One is a URL backlink to the service metadata, and it may or may not be there. Uh, we talked about the service record to the capabilities at the beginning of this talk. This is the opposite, capabilities back to the service document. Um, I'm not really going to talk about that right now. Um, might also have a set of spatial data set identifiers, usually zero, one, or several, uh, which tell you which data set the service provides maps or data for. Um, that links back through an ID um, which you perform a search for to a, a data set metadata record as shown in the, the black arrow saying search. But let's look at a quick example here. Up at the top we have a Inspire extended capabilities that you might find inside a capabilities document and we can see it has a um, service record backlink. I said I'm not going to really talk about that. Um, and an Inspire code and code space right in the middle of the screen there. And then at the bottom, we have a um, data set metadata record. And you can see those records will have a data set, a unique data set identifier, which will have a code and a code space. And basically, you have to do searches between these two types of documents to sort of link them up in either direction. Okay, back to our diagram, going on to the lower half of this. In blue, the, um, the layer section. And each layer might, might have a metadata URL link, and that goes, um, it's a direct link to another data set document that you can download using the techniques we talked about earlier. But a big note of this is that the document that this points to is probably not one of the ones that you harvested. And the reason for that is you probably harvested from a higher level catalog, like a country level catalog, and these are probably pointing to regional catalogs. And those two um, um, metadata records will almost certainly be different. I don't think I've seen any that were actually perfectly the same. And it also has a metadata URL link. So a spatial set, ident oh sorry, um, and a spatial data set identifier that links the data set record to um, a data set record via an ID. And let's look at an example of that. We have an example capabilities layer up at the top. Um, it has a spatial data set identifier. I was just put one in there, so it's very original. Code is identifier, namespace is namespace. And just a note here is that for WFS, WMS, and Atom, they all have a different way of, of um, um, putting that identifier in there, so you the, just have to handle that, but that's usually not, not too difficult. And you can use this to search by ID back into your set of data set metadata records. And also, sort of in the middle of the screen there, you see a metadata URL link, so that's a direct link to a, um, another metadata, uh, data set metadata XML document. 
And there's a lot more details that I'm not really getting on, get, um, getting into here. And I'm going to stop the sort of detailed XML explanations now and, and just talk things at high level. But I did want to make sure that I showed you what was going on. So if you're ever asked to sort of look at one of these things, um, you have an idea of what's going on. Because um, like I said, reading through the specification is, is quite difficult. But you don't read that's up there. I'm just going to summarize. Basically, you harvest all the service metadata records. You harvest all the data set metadata records. You follow all the links in your service um, metadata records to capabilities documents. And then you follow all the links in your capabilities documents. And then you do a bunch of matching based on your extracted identifiers. And then you can sort of link up your data sets and, and actual OGC services. And I'm simplifying quite a bit here. But whew, that's a lot of work. <coughs> Excuse me. Traditionally, it's not easy to go from a data set metadata record to a data or a service. You have to process all the service records and process all the capabilities documents before you can start doing that matching step. And it's not very easy to do that. It takes a lot of work and there's a lot of special cases because everybody has a snowflake way of doing things, so it can be quite difficult. But Inspire realized this is pretty complicated and they're moving, in the process of moving to a simplified link model as I've shown here. The big difference in this is there is a direct link in the capabilities, a direct link to the capabilities document right inside the metadata, um, the, the data set metadata record. Mind blown, it's totally easy. You don't have to go searching. You just follow the link, it's really easy. Um, now you can go directly from the metadata record to the capabilities document without having to harvest and search through all your service documents and do a ton of processing. And then if you do also um, add the metadata URL for each of the layers in your capabilities file, then you have bi-directional. It's really simple bi-directional. And that is, whew, that's shown that dashed arrow, but it's, it's, it's really big. I can't, it's, you know, easy peasy lemon squeezy. It's, it, I can't really emphasize how much easier this is because this is just direct links as opposed to having to search through and have a database of all your, all your endpoints and, and deal with that. Okay, whew, done the hard part. Um, let's summarize with some rubber meets the road type of advice. Let's start with the downloading links, which I talked about at the beginning. First, use the, compute, the complete URL. Don't make people guess what the service is or what the parameters you need to actually talk to that service. Put the full thing in there. The next thing is make it simple to download. The easiest test is to use some type of command line tool like curl to make sure your link resolves and returns XML. Um, don't just copy paste it into a browser. Your browser does a bunch of magic. And make sure your um, SSL certificates are both valid and widely trusted. And again, no uh, simple access. Don't put any strange security procedures in there. Testing with curl will catch most of these. And if you remember my story about the infinitely redirecting, looking for a session cookie, um, yeah, enough said. Yeah, so don't put people in the bad, bad dog box. Um, this is something that happened a few times. You're following a large number of links, thousands and thousands of these links, especially in a large um, set of metadata URL links. And a lot of them aren't correct, and they're pointing to locations that return a 404, uh, not found. Unfortunately, some servers detect this as a URL sc security scan, and they get a little upset with you and don't allow you to connect to that server anymore. So, and at that point, there's not a lot that you can do other than email the system administrator and ask them to be nice for you. And finally, let's talk about linking together data and metadata. So some of the capabilities documents are a bit hilarious. They have 10 to 15,000 layers in them. And by hilarious, I mean totally not funny at all. It's just too many. It really takes a long time to process and a lot of links to follow. Um, I recommend you have a capabilities that's just about one 
a single data set. That keeps things really obvious, and it solves a bunch of other problems that I haven't talked about. Um, this is really easy in something like GeoServer. Just break up your layers into workspaces, um, one workspace per data set, and you can link to a workspace specific capabilities. That's really easy. One data set, one capabilities file. I know Jody is really interested in this because he just did a bunch of work at GeoServer to make that more obvious. Um, again, in the capabilities for each of the layers, make sure there is a metadata URL linked to the data set metadata record. Everyone will love you. Everyone. Seriously, everybody. If those links aren't there, people are probably just going to Google your layer name from your WMS and then give up. Um, and th that metadata URL link on each layer is, is really user friendly, really makes things easier. And you don't want to have to do all that processing and searching uh, that we talked about before. So we want to use the Inspire um, simplified link model. Uh, it's easy and obvious connections. And again, this makes life so much easier. As I said earlier, everybody will love you, everyone. It is so good. And using the simplified um, model and layers, if you have um, also used the simplified link model and have what I said previously on the previous slide, which is a metadata URL for every layer, you have this really nice bi-directional connectivity and it's, it's really awesome, it's so easy to use. So if you're only going to do four things, one, use the full URL and make sure curl resolves, one data set per capabilities, add a metadata URL link to all your layers, data, that gives you your data to metadata link, and use the Inspire data set linkage, simplified Inspired data set linkage, which gives you metadata to data linkage. <sighs> yeah, and then it's, everything is much easier. So, where do we go from here? I mentioned at the beginning, I just put together an open source project that does a bunch of harvesting, follows all the links everywhere, finds all the connections I talked about and a lot more than I haven't talked about. Um, this code already exists and you don't have to write it again. Um, and this code can be leveraged to automatically fix up records to go along with my, all my recommendations. It's super awesome. It can really change a lot of things. So we talked about those incomplete or problematic URLs at the beginning. I can tell you which ones are problematic and what they should be. So boom, fixed. Are your layers missing, are you missing um, um, extended capabilities? I can fix that. I can tell you what the backlinks is to the service metadata document. I can tell you what the spatial data set identifiers are for that capabilities. I can tell you how to split that document up so it's one capabilities per data set. And are your layers missing metadata URLs or spatial data set identifiers? I can tell you what they should be. And that's a huge one because these type of things make your services so much easier to use for people who aren't experts in the field and don't have a bunch of code lying around. And if you're not currently doing the Inspire simplified um, data set linkage, I can tell you what you need to add to your, cap your the, ca the capabilities link and what they should look like to go inside your data set record. And this really is a huge win because it's so easy to use when, this, when they're set up this way. And most of the hard work is already done. You don't have to redo it. I've already done that, so that's really good. It's open source, so you can just download it and go. And to be honest, there's still a lot of work to do. And obviously, I can't make um, magic connections between data sets and uh, metadata when they aren't already pro um, present at some level. But I really think that tools based on this can make um, data managers and editors life's way, way easier, and the resulting data, metadata products, much easier for users and much easier for the people actually working with, that, with creating those, datas, those metadatas. And what more can you want? Thank you very much, Dave. Um, we're going to have to go directly to our next speaker, but uh, thank you very much.